Distinguished academic Professor Asisi Asobi, and a host of all the distinguished personalities who have spoken on the Zig Lecture series in the last decade. I'm indeed humbled that I am standing on such shoulders, shoulders of giants. Accepting the invitation as this year's guest lecturer was intimidating but not difficult at all, given what the late doctor. Nambi Isikiwe has meant to and continues to represent for all of us in Africa and in Nigeria particularly. 26 years after his transition to eternity on 11th May 1996 at the ripe age of 92, the indelible legacy which he left during over seven decades of active and inimitable service to humanity, Africa, and our beloved Nigeria continues to provide us with a source of inspiration and a fountain of wisdom on which to draw, especially in troubled times. It is therefore appropriate from the outset to salute the memory of this great nationalist, frontline hero of our independence, founding father, statesman, pan-Africanist, community leader, and humanist. In his time, Dr. Nembi Ezekiel scored many firsts that can only be recalled with awe and admiration. He was among the pioneering university-educated Africans who sojourned to the United States in their quest for knowledge and self-improvement. He was also a pioneering sportsman, public intellectual, journalist, newspaper proprietor, with at least 12 daily titles in his table at one point in time, including the popular West African pilot. Owner of the Pan-Nigerian Athletic Club and a prolific author. Served as the first Chief Minister, Premier of the Eastern Region, first Indigenous Governor General of our country, first President and Head of State after we became a Republic in 1963, and the first Nigerian to be named to the Privy Council of the United Kingdom. A truly versatile person who built himself up through hard work, a single-mindedness of purpose, an uncommon audacity, and a commitment to the freedom and unity of the African world, even in the face of personal adversity. There are many lessons for all of us in his rich life story. 
unsurprisingly, no conversation about the propagation of the Pan-African ideal, the struggle for decolonization of the African continent, and the shaping of the political evolution of post-colonial Africa can be credible or complete without a fulsome and robust acknowledgement of the contributions of Dr. Benjamin Nandiyazikyo. As a towering figure in the global Pan-African movement, Azikiwe broke bread at various times with other icons of the curse for a wholesale continental rebirth and the speedy restoration of the dignity of black persons all over the world, such as W.E.B. Du Bois, C.L.R. James, Kwame Nkrumah, and Jack Padmore to cite only a few. From an early stage through his writings, he invested himself single-mindedly in thinking through the ways in which the continent could be reinvented as a dignified home for all persons of African descent. His 1937 book, entitled Renaissance Africa, remains a classic in the Pan-African pantheon. And as an indefatigable fighter for the right of all colonized Africans, to self-determination and independence, he effortlessly found common cause with other key figures of the African anti-colonial movement, such as Albert Macaulay, whose right hand associate and successor he subsequently became, Ahmed Benbella, Julius Nyerere, Jomo Kenyatta, Estes Kamuzu Banda, Kenneth Kaunda, the Magai brothers of Sierra Leone, and Ahmed Sekuturi, among others. Within the Nigerian context, and building on the foundation laid by Herbert Macaulay, he forged various bonds of collaboration across the Niger with leading Nigerian nationalist politicians, such as Obafemi Awolowo, Alba Nikoku, Amino Kano, Amadou Bello, Abaka Tafawa Balewa, Hannes Dikoli, Fumilayo Ransom Kuti, Michael Lumodu, Zana Buka Dikcharima, Mokogu Okoye, and Gambosawaba, among many, many others. As a towering figure of the Nigerian nationalist movement, it has been argued with considerable justification that no one could have crowned, could have been crowned by destiny to be more quintessentially Nigerian than Dr. Inambi Isikiri. <laughs> with his ancestry right in the heart of Igbo land in the East. An umbilical cord buried deep in the soil of Tungeru in the North. A professional career nurtured in Yoruba land in the West. Zik was the complete, all-rounded Nigerian who spoke the three major languages. Who spoke the three major languages in the country fluently and more than any of his contemporaries, was very easily at home in all parts of the country, including the different places in which he sojourned as a child, student, young professional, and frontline politician. Many have a potentiality to be great. Azikiwe had the genius to translate that potentiality into a reality that has outlived him. Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I have gone to some length to paint a picture of Dr. Ezekiel just as a gentle reminder to us all that the example of the Colossus of a person who are gathered here today to celebrate tells us that despite all the odds Nigeria has and continues to produce giants whose remarkable deeds leave indelible marks in the sands of time for us to harvest and profit from. What said Zeke and some of his contemporaries apart from others was not that they were perfect people, but the fact that they were perfectly wedded to their forward-looking ideas about the place of the African and indeed the Nigerian in the world. In this regard, Zeke believed in the power of knowledge and ideas as an important pathway to achieving the African Renaissance and for restoring the dignity of global Africa. No matter how old 
an individual may be, Zeke once said, no matter if he is young or old, if he thinks in accordance with the times, he is immortal. Dr. Ezekiel's immortality is based on the enduring power of his pragmatic thoughts and ideas, which remain relevant to our continuing experience as Africans, regardless of ethnic origin, religion, or region. The overarching theme of this combined 9th and 10th lecture series is security, governance, and nation building. It is timely, it's a timely subject for us to reflect upon collectively, given the myriad of intertwining security and governance challenges we are all having to deal with in Nigeria, and indeed in many other places around the world. I cannot help but wonder if the great Sikh were to be alive today, what he would have to say to some of the many challenges that face us as a nation? What would have been Zeke's idea of nation building amidst the centrifugal forces emerging from almost all parts of the country to challenge the foundations of our nationhood as a united Nigeria? It seems to me that it will be fair to say as Zeke would have done, that national security and development are dependent on the resolution of the national question and the associated demands of nation and state building. <laughs> History and comparative experience teach us that where a broad consensus has been built on the fundamental issues underpinning the national question, security and development becomes much easier to attain and to sustain. One of the most critical factors for the success of any nation is the achievement of a broad and enduring consensus amongst the elite drawn from the various walks of life on a fundamental set of questions that are germane to the establishment and nurturing of a stable foundation for the pursuit of security and development. Yet, on the other hand, this is not a charge to be left to political elites only, as doing so is bound to create resentment and feelings of exclusion among lay citizens. A nation's theory of development can only derive from the consensus that has been forged on key national questions, especially those questions related to the issues of identity, religion, participation, justice, and the overall management of diversity. How these are mobilized to define the value of citizenship and to set the parameters for inclusion or exclusion within the nation's socio-economic and political space. As such, there can be no successful nation building in our current climate where a wide section of our citizens are apathetic to the very idea of the nation state and perceive the political institutions that govern them as enemies. For many, nation building is no more than an age-old idealistic rhetoric that has no bearing on lived realities. My argument has always been, though, that we cannot speak of national development without first resolving the key issues of nation building. I make bold, therefore, to say that the security challenges that are confronting us in all their various dimensions and ramifications and all the issues of governance and stability that we are confronted with are directly consequential upon our inability to settle some fundamental questions of nationhood and find points of convergence in a plural society like ours. Where the very existence of the nation itself is easily brought to question at the slightest provocation, it should serve as a warning to us that the very foundation upon which the nation is standing is either weakening or has collapsed. In either case, measures aimed at reinforcing that foundation must be adopted speedily, settling our foundational challenges and doing so frontally is a sine qua non for the successful forging of consensus that is needed for moving the country forward with a unity of purpose 
a common vision of our greatness, shared values of solidarity, and a sense of equity and justice. Yet, the challenges of nation building are not exclusive to Nigeria or African states as is often ascribed. Our small model nation states in the West are falling short of their cohesive ideals and grappling with the challenges of national divisiveness. In the case of Nigeria, some have argued with some merit, I must admit, that we cannot build Nigeria into a truly united nation until we somehow boil down all our ethnic and other differences into one homogeneous melting pot. For the nation to live, the tribe must die, was the clarion call. This was the exact thinking that underpinned the Westphalian model of the modern nation state in Europe. But history has shown, however, that difference is a permanent feature of the human condition and it does not preclude the nurturing of bonds that unite. Moreover, human beings have natural affinities to their ethnic and linguistic groups that are too resilient to be simply swept aside artificially. None of us chose to be Nigerians, but having found ourselves in this geographic space called Nigeria, we're left with two real alternatives. One is to make it work for everyone. The other is to break it up and let everyone return to their ethnic enclaves. The latter option has never proven to be better or more sustainable than the former. <laughs> Speaking in the context of Nigeria's three regions in the early years of our independence, Dr. Zikiwe noted as follows, and I quote, each of our three regions is vastly different in many respects, but each has this in common, that despite variety of languages and customs or difference in climate, all form part of one country, which has existed as a political and social entity for 50 years at the time it was writing. That is why we believe that the political union of Nigeria is destined to be perpetual and indestructible. It was a message to say that despite differences of various types, we are not confronted with climates that are insurmountable as we invest in the building of enduring parameters of nation good. No political union is created perfect, and none enjoys perfection as a permanent condition. What is encouraging, and which Nandi Ezekiel understood and preached always, is that through visionary leadership, doors are open for us to invest in forging a more perfect union from generation to generation. Like most of his contemporaries, Zeke acknowledged our diversity in ethnicity, religion, tongues, and custom, but he regarded Nigeria as the motherland. I believe that in choosing to describe Nigeria as the motherland, he was being deliberate. No one gets to choose their mothers or change their mothers. It is a relationship that is perpetual and indestructible. In the context of the many historical events that have unfolded in the country over the years since independence, some have been tempted in the thick of zero-sum partisanship to suggest that perhaps Zeke had too much faith in the Project Nigeria or allowed himself to be blinded to the many dysfunctions that have racked the nation-building process. In my considered opinion, both suggestions are wrong and unhelpful insofar as they betray a fundamental understanding of the roots of his nationalism, which set great store by unity in the march to greatness. As a key architect in the making of contemporary Nigeria, it would have been too much to expect that Azikiwe will also easily embrace a path 
that will lead to its dismemberment. To do so would have amounted to a wholesale self-repudiation. The greatest test which he faced came at the onset of the Nigerian Civil War and the polarization which required all key actors to pitch their tent with one side or the other in the conflict. It had to be one of the most difficult moments in his entire political life, watching the potential disintegration of Nigeria while also seeking to understand the fullness of the grievances in Eastern Nigeria that unfold the drive towards the creation of the Afra. One of the enduring controversies of the Nigerian Civil War was the actual role that Dr. Azikiwe played or did not play in that conflict. It was the real life equivalent of being caught between a rock and a hard place. Treading with the utmost caution, he did stick out his neck to make a plea for the abandonment by the conflicting parties of the resort to violence and a resumption of dialogue. Perhaps there is something in this approach that contemporary gladiators in the ongoing challenges to Nigerian nationhood may want to take as food for thought. <laughs> like all people imbued with a profound intellect, Azikiwe's favored strategy for tackling differences was encapsulated by the French word parliament, or parliament in English which means discussions, meetings, or negotiations until a compromise can be forged. In the fight for Nigeria's independence, Zik insisted, and I quote him, we will not shed blood. We will not force the British to shoot at us. And he advised all of his fellow anti-colonial nationalists around Africa to adopt the same strategy. In embracing the philosophy of non-violence, Zeke was undoubtedly influenced by his experience with the civil rights movement in the United States and the example of Mahatma Gandhi. But apart from a deep commitment to humanism and the sanctity of human life, Zeke's non-violence was also born out of pragmatism. He did not think there was any wisdom in taking to the battlefield against an enemy that is more powerful than you. However, and with the heavy artillery of your intellect and the morality and justness of your cause, you can make an enemy retreat. Dialogue, according to Zeke, is more compelling and can oftentimes be even more resounding than the staccato of the Kalashnikov. Zeke's non-violence also had nothing to do with the surrender mentality, as some have suggested. Thus, even as he made efforts to stop the Nigerian civil war from becoming an inevitability and escalating, he also made it clear that justice, fairness, and equity in the administration of the Commonwealth were fundamental preconditions for peace and unity to be won and sustained. He called for an end to the war hostilities and the reintegration of the Biafran back into Nigeria, provided, he said, and I quote, that Nigeria will continue to ensure the safety of persons and properties of the Afrans in one united country where all its citizens will be treated as equals without any discrimination and where there will be opportunities for all citizens and inhabitants. <laughs> End of quote. History has taught us that wars, especially civil wars, could be one of our a country's self-introspect and find its true identity and a pathway to transformation. As with the American Civil War, which historians have suggested was also America's war of socioeconomic transformation, there have been suggestions that out of the record of the Civil War, Nigeria might successfully reconstruct itself and move on to the path of structural change. All things considered, amidst the optimism unleashed under the banner of the three R's of post-war reconstruction, reconciliation, and reintegration. Few will disagree that we are yet to achieve the high hopes that flourished amidst the oil boom of the 1970s, that we were well on the way to fulfilling our destiny to greatness. 
with persistent challenges of state and nation building and a myriad of developmental discontent, the rise of separatist agitations in recent years and the rhetoric of such agitation indicates that there are still people in this country, indeed many of them, who feel that Nigeria is not working for them, who still feel marginalized in the scheme of things, who frame this discontent in ethnic, religious, or regional terms, and who believe that the only solution is for them to be allowed to go and form their own country. It is important to note that complaints about marginalization are not exclusively or always solely directed at the federal center. Within the regions and states that have made up the Nigerian Federation at various times since 1960, people who feel they are not getting a fair deal or equality of opportunity also complain of marginalization. The standard solution that has been pursued has been to clamor for more states in the expectation that the interest of those who feel marginalized will be better served if they have a state of their own to themselves. Going by the persistent agitation for the creation of more states, it is easy to assume that this content at the subnational level is real, persistent, and widespread. Since the 1946 Richards Constitution that created the three regions of the Nigerian Federation, agitation for the creation of, of more regions has been rife, particularly among the minority ethnic groups. The subsequent creation of states in 1967, 76, 87, 91, and 96 has not stained the vociferous demand for more states. While the 2005 National Political Reform Conference set up by the Obasanjo administration concluded that the creation of new states was not feasible, the 2014 National Conference by the Jonathan administration recommended the creation of 18 new additional states to make Nigeria into a federation of 54 states. The infinite political market for the creation of an ever-increasing number of states in the Nigerian federal system is an indicator of the fact that the successive rounds of state creation, which we have had to date, have not produced the El Dorado that successive generations of agitators thought the exercise would produce. The more states are created, the more new perceptions of marginalization are multiplied. It cannot be viable to steer the country into an over-fragmentation that cancels out the effectiveness of the administration of the common good. Another argument by those who are still clamoring for the creation of more states is that doing so will bring government closer to a particular people who are otherwise marginalized on their current arrangement. Even if this were true, it is debatable whether mere geographical proximity can deliver good governance and improve the quality of lives of the people without a corresponding commitment to development generally. Shared geographical space does not automatically translate into shared resources and equitable and fair distribution. Solidarity can at times be situational, and if there is nothing more than agitation for states without deeper commitments to what constitutes shared value between state and citizens, the center may not hold. There is no such thing as a homogeneous society not even a homogeneous family. The ties that bind are the mutually shared values that accommodate differences. In the absence of this, conflict is almost always inevitable. Perhaps of greater concern is the growing evidence that many of our states are fast becoming economically unviable. This situation will get worse as the amount that will be available for allocation from the center dwindles in tandem with the decline in oil revenues. It is therefore reasonable to argue that the solution to the problem of lack of equity or marginalization within a state is not the creation of more states, which may end up only creating new arenas of conflict. Even if it were possible to ensure that only people of the same ethnic group or religion occupy a state 
this will still not stop the complaint of marginalization as some people would always be better off than others. I am from one of the most homogeneous states in Nigeria and I can confirm to you that there is still agitation of marginalization. The argument against the agitation for the creation of more states can also be extended to those who think that the best solution to the problem of real and all perceived marginalization in Nigeria is outright secession from the country. While it is easy to understand the sentiment that drives the kind of extreme positions adopted by groups like the Masor or IPOB, South Sudan declared independence from Sudan in 2011, following an agreement signed in 2005 to end what was regarded as Africa's longest civil war. According to South Sudan sources, the war was fought to resist Islamization and Arabization by the North and to preserve their ethnic identity as Africans, animists, and Christians. The discovery of rich deposits of crude oil in the South also added fuel to the conflict and reinforced agitations for separation, especially after the death in an air crash of the historic leader of the Sudan People's Liberation Movement, John Garand. Those who had expected independence to bring the long overdue peace to the Sudan, North and South, were sorely disappointed when within two years of winning the freedom to self-determination, a civil war broke out within South Sudan itself, leading to the death of over 400,000 people and the displacement of an estimated 4 million more. In the period since then, the young country has alternated between conflict and an easy peace, complete with a UN peacekeeping mission. In the meantime, in what was left of Sudan after the separation of South Sudan and its accession to independence, various mini conflicts underwritten by an assortment of armed groups challenging the authority in Khartoum have been the order of the day. Darfur in Sudan became both an embodiment and symbol of the tragedy of war that befell the country, even as South Sudan was also locked in a violent struggle for power driven, uh, power -driven by interethnic distrust and an unreconstructed system of political monopoly. Since the ousting of President Omar al Bashir in 2019, the North itself had been trapped in an unhappy transitional arrangement that has culminated in a second flexing by the military of its muscle in the domestic political process. So, those who are sold on the logic of secession may counter this analogy by, by outlining the differences between South Sudan and Southeast of Nigeria and how the outcome of independence will be different in both cases. It is true that while the southeast of Nigeria is relatively homogeneous in language, culture, and religion, South Sudan has about 60 different ethnic groups. However, it is important to remember that when they were united in the fight against Khartoum for independence, the South Sudanese put up a united, practically homogeneous front. The breakdown in their unity only burst into the open as independence loomed. No matter how homogeneous it may appear, no society is ever bereft of differences and cleavages that are required to be managed on an ongoing basis through engaged and visionary leadership. If the simple fact of apparent ethnocultural homogeneity was an absolute guarantee for stability and progress, we may never have had a cycle of genocide in Burundi and Rwanda or a broken Somalia on our hands. It is therefore safe to state that while diversity does not guarantee a slide into war, homogeneity does not guarantee a sustained peace either. In fact, as the award-winning author Yuval Harari has argued, it is by our common conflicts and dilemmas that we define our identity, not by our common traits. Therefore, he observes, the people we fight most often are our own family members. Identity is defined by conflict and dilemmas more 
than by agreement. And as we say in Yoruba land, it is the person that you lie in the same bed with that you bump into. We must therefore learn to manage our differences and do so in order to achieve the goal of a better and a more perfect union. If separation and secession are not as easy or simple as their proponents imagine, and given that they do not provide any guarantees that a better future can be secured through them, the demands for a national restructuring would seem to me to be worth keeping on the table for deeper consideration. In doing so, we have a duty to frame and contextualize the cost for restructuring as part of a normal process of regular and periodic adjustment and recalibration of governance arrangements to changing times and context. This will represent a departure from the negative and adversarial connotations which proponents and opponents have attributed to the idea of restructuring, turning it into another source of rancor, recrimination, and division. However, at the end, when all the dust around the issue settles, we find that we are all confronted with the same fundamental question. How do we make Nigeria work best for every Nigerian? Like the great Zig Positive, how do we build a nation where the safety of every citizen is assured and where there will be equal opportunities for all, regardless of the language they speak, the place they come from, or how they worship God? Dr. Nandi Azikiwe envisioned a country that would be perpetual and indestructible on account of its ability to remain adaptive and responsive to the shifting challenges and its commitments to meet the aspirations of every generation of Nigerians. The indestructibility of Nigeria, as envisaged by Zik, is indeed best assured when the majority of Nigerians are emotionally connected to Nigeria because of what Nigeria is able to do for them. In essence, the legitimacy of the nation state is not in making demands of patriotism, but in the quality of life it provides for its citizens towards building mutual trust and the common good. The question therefore is this, is Nigeria as currently structured capable of delivering the full benefits of citizenship to every Nigerian? The answer to this is obvious. Certainly, the growing army of our frustrated and disenchanted youth do not think so. One might even argue that our generation of young people are actively engaged in alternative spaces of micro-nation building projects of their own in the absence of a perceived nurturing state. We see this in the ways common identities and aspirational notions of what Nigeria could be in new media spaces entertainment and other forms of identity-making projects youth have taken up and successfully too. Yet, when the Nigerian story is told, we very often focus on a disproportionate amount of attention on what does not work about our union. And perhaps that in itself may not be a bad thing if rather than being weaponized to undermine our collective will, it is framed as a clarion call to do more and do better and with greater purpose. It is important also not to forget that there exist important views that bind us together as Nigerians, regardless of our differences, and these views also de deserve to be reinforced. I am convinced that the problems that we are called upon to address and redress in building a better country are not beyond our grasp to tackle. With good faith, and a generous dose of goodwill, we can, as we have done on various occasions in our history, summon that Nigerian genius to build on the things we have successfully erected together. We must strive to do so in the spirit of the kind of noble values and principles that inflame the spirit of a youthful Azikiwe to enroll at Lincoln University in a quest to discover the innate goodness in the human species with a view to building a better and freer world. We must never abandon the spirit of inquiry and discovery that led us way to join other nationalists to seek to create a nation state founded on the best ideals 
of citizenship and call on freedom and justice. We, the people of Nigeria, must truly mean that our considered aspirations are fed into the document that will form the fundamental organizing principle of our nation group. The opportunities are there. The question of how to develop our democratic system that meets the expectations of our people and restores pe people's trust in government, how to bring ethical principles, empathy and efficiency to the heart of government and leadership at all levels, how to harness our demographic advantage and translate our youth population into an asset rather than a time bomb, how to build a society that is governed by the rule of law, how to build an electoral system that is reliable and efficient, or how to build a trusted, dependable and efficient judiciary. All these are at the very heart of what I see as the broad package of restructuring that we need to work towards. It is a package around which we can forge a broad consensus. And I believe that we don't need to go through another war or tear down our country to arrive at such a consensus. Of course, the cynics amongst us would like to ask me that if I'm so confident that we can resolve these issues through dialogue or any other form of parliament, how come such previous efforts have failed to lead to the desired outcome? My answer will be that the national transformation that we seek can only happen through the transformation of the individual and the individual's transformation in relation to fellow citizens and in relation to the nation itself. People create systems and not the other way around. It is only, it is only by the transformation of the individual that we can hope to do that which is necessary for the transformation of our country. While the notion of social contract is central in exploring the relationship between the state and citizens, as the rabbi and moral philosopher Jeffrey Sachs reminds us, it is inadequate in dealing with our current challenges simply because social contract creates a state, social covenant creates a society. Social contract is about power and how it is to be handled with a police, within a political framework. Social covenant is about how people live together despite their differences. Social contract is about government. Social covenant is about coexistence. Social contract is about laws and their enforcement. Social covenant is about the values we share. Social contract is about the use of potentially coercive force. Social covenant is about moral commitment the values we share and the ideals that inspire us to work together for the sake of the common good. For me, this encapsulates the idea of nation building at its best. A contract must be founded on cohesion, a covenant to stay true to the agreed contract. All parties must agree to avoid contestations, achieving a sense of common identity, strong institutions, and shared values as a nation is a process of building trust and finding unity in difference. This is how we build the sort of national relationship that is not an exploitative social contract, but a moral commitment that combines individual and state obligations. Permit me to conclude with this admonition. Regardless of how long it takes, and whatever we do in between, War or violence is never an option. Believe me, I should know. I hold a doctorate degree in war studies. Therefore, I feel adequately qualified to speak about the futility of war and violence. There is absolutely nothing heroic about dying foolishly for a cause for which dialogue and negotiation can provide pathways to work in solutions. Whatever is worth fighting for is worth staying alive for. I can very much hear this refrain flowing from the life experience and legacy of Dr. Nandi Azikiwe. And if the great sick were alive today, this is precisely what he will be telling this August gathering. Let us hack into his words of wisdom. Thank you for listening. <laughs>